my privilege to get to uh, lead in this time uh, with our sermon this morning. Grateful to John for the opportunity. Looking forward to having him back. I'm between Dave Ross and John Childers. I don't know where that puts me in the rank of things, um, but I'm happy to get the opportunity. We're going to get to a very familiar passage of scripture this morning in Romans chapter 8, but we're going to travel a little ways before we get there. The title of my message is In All Things. There's a common and dangerous misconception among many believers about the Christian life. We often hear it from popular television preachers, you know the kind, the kind with the whitened teeth and the private jets, those guys. Um, They're not the only source of the lie, though. And that lie, that message is that if we are living for God, then our bank accounts will be large, we'll have the latest model luxury car parked in our garage, and our health will be fantastic all due to our faith. Nowhere in God's word does it say this. Whether you call it name it, claim it, or health and wealth, by whatever name it's called, it is not the gospel. It's a myth. If it can't be preached in the third world, it's not the gospel, I promise you. Nowhere in God's word is there a promise of life that comes without any thorns in it. In fact, quite the opposite, as we'll discover today, the Bible promises us that we will have troubles in this world, that people will persecute us. Rather than faith being something that causes us to avoid suffering, instead, the suffering that inevitably comes to all lives will instead strengthen your faith. Instead of being perplexed or crushed or defeated by the trials of life, the bottom line is that we can be, in fact, I would suggest this morning that we must be thankful to God in all things, Because all things cause us to rely on him and cause us to be shaped into God's image. Let's pray. Father, I pray this morning that we would see you as an all-sufficient God who walks through us through all the trials of life and who uses those trials for your glory, but even for our purpose and for our betterment. Lord, help us to trust you in all things because we know you are good. In Jesus' name. So I already mentioned this, my first point this morning, and and we gave you the answer in the bulletin ahead of time, just, you know, to make life easier for you. In this world, we will have trouble, right? I'm just leading right off with the good news, right? I promise we'll get to the good news. John chapter 16, verse 33, Jesus said, I have said these things to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. He he says it's a given. We will have trouble. We will have tribulation. It's going to happen. You're either probably going through something right now, or you just went through something, or maybe you're about to go through something. And possibly all three of those things, if things come in threes like they sometimes do, um, but God is with you through all of those. But don't be surprised when trouble comes. It doesn't throw us off. It doesn't Make us wonder where God is that day. God is not off the throne when, thro- when trouble comes to our lives. He is active and alive and ready to work. In this world, we will have trouble. Some more promises to start off this morning. A faithful life will bring persecution. Matthew 10, says, Jesus says, And you will be hated by all for my name's sake, but the one who endures to the end will be saved. And Matthew 24, 9, Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and put you to death, and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. So persecution will come. There's that story of, of the little boy who's 10 or 11, has followed Christ in his life, attends public school, and his parents are praying with him one night, and dad's kind of pressing him. He said, son, is there anything I can pray for you about? No, dad, everything's great. But son, is there anything at school you know, going on that maybe I can pray for you for? No, Dad, everything's great. And he kind of presses a little more, but son, I I know that when you're a Christian, people sometimes will make fun of you or worse because of your faith. Are you encountering that at school? Can I pray for you, you know, because of the way people treat you? And he said, Dad, you don't understand. I just don't tell them, right? Sometimes we have to wonder if we're not enduring any tribulation, if we're not enduring any persecution, is our witness bold enough? Are we putting ourselves, not that we would intentionally throw ourselves out there to be trampled upon, but when we are faithful to him, often that will lead us right into that persecution that the world dishes out for us. Um, But, this is where we start to turn the tide a little bit, 
suffering will help to your, your faith to mature. So when we suffer, our faith is going to mature. Two verses, well, two passages. The first one in Acts 5.41. Then they left the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor for the name. So they considered it an honor in the early church to suffer as long as their suffering was because of Jesus. We do have to evaluate, by the way, when we think we're being persecuted, are we really being persecuted for our faith? Or is it for some annoying habit that we have that we could easily overcome? Um, if hopefully it's for our faith. Romans 5, 1 through 5 is really a foundational verse, a foundational passage on how God uses these trials in our life. It says, therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace through our Lord Jesus, peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him, we have also obtained access into faith, into this grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame or does not disappoint because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. You want a mature faith? Romans 5 just laid out the way you get there. You get there by going through some stuff. And so as, as we start from this point this morning, don't think that I bring suffering up lightly. There are still places in the world where people die for their faith. There have been more martyrs in the last century than there were in the first 20 centuries combined. There are still places in the world where you're killed for your faith. There are still places where if you're a Christian, you'll be subject to torture. You'll be subject to brainwashing. They'll do anything they can to try to dissuade you from following Jesus. There are places where Christian women will be raped if they have surrendered to, to Christ. There are places where children will be at risk of being sold into slavery where adults might be sent to labor camps, all because of their faith in Christ. So sometimes the American definition, the Western definition of suffering, or of persecution especially, is far different from what the world experiences. But with all of this being true during the time of Paul, and still being true in some places in the world today, when Paul says in Romans 5.3, not only that, we rejoice also in our sufferings. He's not saying this speculatively. This isn't a theory that he's proposing. It's not his hypothesis that, oh, by the way, if I were to suffer, I would count it something to rejoice in. Paul suffered a lot, right? They were long and hard sufferings. 2 Corinthians 12, 9, he says, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. He knew that when he suffered greatly, the testimony became about what God could do instead of what Paul could do. And so he rejoiced in that. See the connection here between Romans 5.3? We rejoice in our sufferings. And then this verse that Paul says where he says, I'm boasting gladly of my sufferings. Paul isn't grumbling about his sufferings. He's not playing the victim card. He doesn't have a pity party. He rejoices in his sufferings. It's not just, you know, kind of grit, grin and bear it, you know, fake it till you make it kind of thing. He rejoices in his sufferings. So as we look today at the afflictions that might come against your faith, remember that they can come in many forms. They can be the failing of your health or the failing of the health of a loved one. They can be relationships that are strained or broken or job losses or disappointments. They might be accidents or natural disasters, verbal or physical assaults from somebody, and even just the inconveniences that we face every day that sometimes we think are all designed to be against us, the, the house falling apart. Uh, for us, that, the other day, that was our new puppy chewing through some drywall. That was a blessing. Uh, it could be the traffic on 270. It might be not making the team at some point in your life. Whatever it is that makes your life harder, or causes your faith in God's goodness to potentially be shaken, that can be counted as a tribulation. And from our scripture, we know these are normal. They're not abnormal. In fact, it would be abnormal not to have these if you're a believer. So Paul taught the churches, according to Acts 14.22, strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith, 
and saying that through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of God. So let's get to our passage this morning, Romans 8, verse 28 through 32. Very familiar passage. And we know for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed into the image of his Son, in order that he might be firstborn among many brothers. And those who he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those who he justified, he also glorified. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? This passage today, our, our focal passage, is one of the most quoted verses in the Bible. I'm sure you've said it to yourself when you needed encouragement. I'm sure you've offered it to somebody else when they were going through a tough time. To be honest with you, sometimes we use this verse so many times, verse 28, that we're reluctant to want to hear it. There was even a Christian song a few years ago where somebody's going through some stuff and they said, don't Romans 8.28 me, All right? Well, I'm here to Romans 8.28 you this morning because it's good stuff and we need to hear it. So many things we go through in life are, are pointless or evil uh, or painful, right? Um, and if our faith enables us to, we can hold fast to these all things in Romans 8.28 that we believe that because of the word of God, that this terrible thing, this present annoyance, this trial that we're going through, through, will in the realm of heavenly mathematics turn out for my good and turn out for your good. Turn out for good. We as Christians believe that sooner or later, all of life's pains and all of life's losses and all of life's letdowns will work together for good because God said they would. You may have noticed that in the English Standard Version, it reads a little bit different from the NIV, uh, which says, in all things, God works for the, for the good, right? The NASB makes God the subject of the verb and all things the direct object. The NASB says, God causes all things to work together for good. The NIV also makes God the subject, but makes all things where he works rather than the object. In all things, God works for the good. If you have the King James or the ASV that I just read a minute ago, all things are the subject. All things work together for good. So you see those three differences? God causes all things in all things, or all things work together for good. These are all possible and, and good translations from the original Greek. And they really don't differ that much, but even the slight difference in, in these variations perhaps helps us see just how powerful God is, right? His ability to work through all things. He's the one working. He's the one working in them. He's the one orchestrating them to work. All of that is good. He's the one bringing beauty from ashes. He's the one who's bringing good from some of the most awful things that we could ever go through or endure. Paul is not saying that all the things are good, right? And he didn't say that all the things themselves turned out good. But what he's saying is that he will turn them in your life for good. All things work together for good. Secondly, this morning, all things happen to us with God's knowledge. All things happen to us with God's knowledge. In the broader context of Romans 8, we get a taste of all these things that, Roman, that, that Paul is talking about in Romans. And by the way, spoiler alert, they're mostly not good things. In fact, almost every verse before verse 28 and after 28, that mentions events tend to be painful events that happen to us. And so without this passage, Romans 8, 28 through 32, right there, our prospects are bleak. If all we read about are all the bad things that are going to happen to us, but these five verses of encouragement turn things around to give us encouragement and hope, no matter how hard the situation, no matter how much the pain, no matter how bleak the outlook. Listen to what some of these all things are. In Romans 8, verse 17 says we will be glorified with Christ if we suffer with him. Verse 18 says that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing to the glory that will be revealed to us. Verse 20 and 21 of Romans 8 
says that the creation, including us, is subject to futility, living under a curse and in bondage to decay. Verse 23 says that Christians groan with creation, waiting for redemption to come to our sick and dying bodies. Verse 24 says, For in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what he sees? So we can't see what we hope for. Our salvation is essentially invisible. And much of the benefit of our salvation, while we benefit greatly here, but much of the benefit is largely in the future. We have been saved. We are being saved. But ultimately on that day, we will be saved. And that's when God's kingdom really begins and when we rejoice forever, when there's no more crying and and no more pain and no more suffering. Now, after our passage, uh, verse 35 says, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? A list of things that could happen to you there. And the answer is, they're not going to separate you, right? These are things that are likely to come. And Romans 8.28 has already told us that in all of them, all of the suffering, all of the decay, all of the tribulations, all of the famine, all of the peril of the sword, that in all of them, God is working all things together for good. So the answer to the question from Romans 8.31 in our passage, what then shall we say in response to this? If God is for us, who can be against us? is yes, there are some things that can be against us. It's kind of implied that things will be against you. But whether they be adversaries or obstacles or breakdowns or operation or sorry or uh, opposition or misery, verse 37 gives us the final answer. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through he through him who loved us. So if you know him today, if God drew you to himself through his Holy Spirit, to Christ for the forgiveness of sins, if you have received the free gift of salvation and the righteousness that comes only from faith, then you can know beyond a shadow of doubt that all things will work together for your good. God will be with you, his wisdom and his power, and there is no one or nothing that can come successfully against you. A great example of this from the Old Testament is the life of Joseph, is it not? Brother sold him into slavery. He gets shipped down to Egypt, but he's faithful to God and finds a position of power in Potiphar's house. Potiphar's wife slanders him because he wouldn't give up his, his moral ground, and she gets him thrown into jail. And yet he rose to prominence in the jail and was trusted there, so much so that he had the opportunity to interpret a dream and rose to be essentially the number two person in the land. God blessed Joseph over and over again, But if all he was counting were were setbacks, there were plenty of them. Sold into slavery, thrown into jail because of a false accusation. In none of those did he say, woe is me. Why is this happening to me? In every situation, he looked to honor God. And because he looked to to honor God in every situation, God blessed his path and worked all of those things out for the good. So so think about how big this promise is in Romans 8.28 this morning. It's beyond measure. It's, uh, Randy Travis would say it's, it's deeper than the holler and it's wider than the river. I won't sing the song for you. But it's massive. If it's a building, it'd be the biggest building you'd ever seen. The God of the universe promises to make everything beneficial. Everything. Not just the good things, but the bad things. When he says all, he means all. And we'll get to that idea of all things even a little bit deeper here in just a minute. Outside of Romans 8.28 is confusion and anxiety and fear and uncertainty. There's Murphy's Law that's out there. There's a title of a book that they read in school nowadays, and I read in school by Chinua Achebe called uh, Things Fall Apart. That's just the truth of life is that things fall apart. There's only substitutes in this world for ultimate hope because only hope comes in Christ. Without the, the hope that we have in Christ, everything is destined to or subject to failure. When you build your life on the rock of Christ, you build it on the foundation of all things. You find stability. You find freedom. The day's events, big or small, can't blow you down. You're not overcome with worry about the news of this kingdom 
because you know that the sovereign God is building his kingdom and he's governing it all. No matter how bad the headlines are, God is in charge of all of it. And whether you're experiencing pain currently or whether you're experiencing a season of pleasure in life, it's all incomparable to the life that he offers you and what he offers you, peace and hope and power. There is nothing that can be promised to you in all the world that is larger than the dimensions of the promise made to you in Romans 8.28. So third this morning, and we've already talked about this, God can move powerfully through trying times. Go back to, to verse 29 and to verse 30 in Romans chapter 8. And it says, For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those who he called, he also justified. And those who he justified, he also glorified. You see, when our trust is exercised, our faith is strengthened. So many times we don't get the opportunity or we don't take the opportunity to trust God. We trust ourselves. And when we only trust in ourselves, that faith muscle atrophies. And we don't build up that muscle of relying on him and running to him and depending upon him for everything. And so uh, we can rejoice in the hope that we have that when we've exercised our faith in this world, then we can run. We can grow stronger in that faith. Uh, there is strength in an exercised faith that doesn't exist in an atrophied faith. We learn to hold on to what can't be taken away. Though we often stumble on what today's passage really says, and especially what I just read, some of you might have checked out for a moment there mentally because there was foreknowledge and predestination and things like that. When I go preach different places, people try to pin, pin you down. Like, are you one of those? I just believe what the Bible says, and I read what the Bible says right there. And what it means to me is that there is a guarantee of Christ's saving work, and because he has that foreknowledge, he is in position to move and has the power to move through and in everything we go through in all the events of my life. And knowing that he's got this makes life more bearable, does it not? So I want to share with you before we close here, I have one more point after I share this with you, a few more all things verses. Because this is not the only all things verse. Do, do a word study later on. I'm only going to scratch the surface a little bit. But, but listen to these. Corinthians 10, 1 Corinthians 10, 31 says, Therefore, whatever you, or whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all things for the glory of God. All things. In 1 Corinthians 13, 7, which we hear at weddings, love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. 1 Corinthians 15, 27 says, For God has put all things together, in subjection under his feet. 2 Corinthians 9, 8, And God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work. Philippians 2, 14 says, Do all things without grumbling or disputing. Philippians 3, 8 says, Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. And then perhaps the most famous other all things verse is Philippians 4.13. I can do all, three, all things through Christ who gives me strength. Well, we take that verse way out of context, right? Because if you read the rest of Philippians 4, what it's talking about, Paul says, I've had absolutely everything and been wealthy and had plenty and I've had nothing and been in complete and utter want, and I've learned the secret to being content in every and any situation, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Those two all things are connected, by the way. The fact that he can do all things in any of those circumstances is because he knows that all of those circumstances, all of those things are directed by God, and God has a hand in making them turn out for good. When we read the word all, we know it means all. Right? When, when we share the gospel with somebody and we go to Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fall short of the, of the glory of God, and you ask somebody, well, who does all mean? Does that include you? Does that include me? The answer is yes, it, 
does include us. Well, when we talk about all things, does it include that thing you went through 10 years ago that you still remember or that thing you went through last week that was really particularly troublesome in your life? Yeah, it includes all of those things. All means all. So finally this morning, the Holy Spirit, because of all of this, will lead us to be thankful in everything that happens in our life. It really is about giving thanks. There was a Scottish minister, his name was Alexander White, and he was known for his uplifting prayers at the pulpit. Every time he came to pray, he had something to be grateful for. And there are some people in any congregation who prefer melancholy and pessimism and I mean, the glass isn't even half full. There's barely anything in it as far as they're concerned. And they'll remind you of it all the time. And he had a few of those folks in his congregation. And on one particularly rainy Sunday morning, and now I'm talking about Scotland, right? So it wasn't just drizzling outside. It had to be bad for for Scottish people to be moved by it. They said, well, I wonder what Pastor White's going to have to say about this, right? Surely he can't make anything good out of this. And when he got up to pray, He said, thank you, Lord, that it isn't always this way, right? You've been through some storms, but when you're in between the storms, give thanks to God. And when you're in the storm, give thanks to God that you know you'll come out of it at some point, either in this life or in eternity. God's going to see you through. He's promised to be with you always. And so we will remember that God is for us and that nothing can separate us from him. That was the conclusion in verse 31 and 32. What can separate us? Absolutely nothing can separate us from him. And we can be thankful for the work of God in all of our circumstances. Um, another all verse this morning, 1 Thessalonians five sixteen through 18. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Give thanks not for all circumstances, but give thanks in all circumstances because God is working in them. So in conclusion, I, I want you to talk to somebody. Now, this is the early service. This will probably sound more appropriate in the late service. There's a lot of wisdom in this room. But talk to somebody you know who's a strong Christian, somebody who's been through some stuff, somebody who's a few steps further down the road in their walk of faith with you. And maybe this will be you talking to somebody who's new in the faith to share your perspective. But talk to somebody who's been through some stuff as a Christian and ask them how they became the mature believer that you see before you today. How did you get to that point of trust and faith and hope in Christ where it's just evident in your life when people look at you? And, and ask how that tragedy molded them. No one enjoys pain or suffering. As we mature in Christ, however, we come to experience and we come to clearly see and hopefully we even become able to anticipate the blessings that come from hard times. It's not what the world would call just a silver lining, right? I'm not asking you to grasp at straws and, and find some little, and I, I'm, I'm an optimist, so I can do this. I, I don't like the summer because it's way too hot, but I celebrate the hottest day of the year, which statistically speaking is about July 19th. Really, this year it happened a few weeks ago in August when the heat index was 118. I'll celebrate when it's 118 heat index because it's not always going to be this way. Because for the next six months, the average temperature is going to go down. And by the way, if you dislike winter, it works the same way. On the shortest day of the year in December or the coldest day of the year in January, rejoice. The tide's going to turn. Spring is coming. It won't always be this way. But it's more than that. It's understanding that our faithful God, the keeper of all promises, can and will use every situation that we find ourselves in to strengthen our faith, to cause us to rely upon him more. Without the tough times that come to us, we would not grow in Christ-likeness. And I think we would agree that's the goal of our faith, is to become more like him, to become more mature in him. And so the things you're going through are temporary. Greater things await. God is good all the time, and all the time God is good. Our future glory is secure, so we need not be shaken by whatever happens today. In case we needed one last reminder from Paul, he gives it to us in Colossians 1, 16 through 20. Listen to what Paul says. He says, For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, 
All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body of the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in him everything might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of the cross. There it is, theologically, what you're looking for. He it says, and through him to reconcile to himself all things. God knows. He knows what you're going through. He hasn't stopped watching. He hasn't stopped taking an account. He hasn't stopped being active in your life. He's not passive in your life. He, he sees what's going on, and he's going to make all things work for his good, for your good, and for his glory if you trust him and if you love him. How will knowing that change your life today? How will knowing that change your life this week? Let's pray. Father, we are grateful that nothing can come to us whether it surprises us or not, nothing can come to us that, that shakes the truth that you are Lord. Nothing can come that would displace you or knock you off the throne. Nothing catches you unaware, God. There's nothing in our life that has ever happened where you've been surprised by it. And Lord, because we know you know us and because you've promised to make things work out for good, help us to patiently endure when life doesn't go the way that we wish that it would. Help us be thankful that you're still active. Help us be anticipating the good things that will come from what happens, even when it's not pleasant in our life. Help us trust you in all things this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to have a time of response. This is an opportunity to, to pray and to answer.